Today we're going to do section 8.4. There's a little typo here. Let's just say 8.4, um, which is on relations between sides of angles, sides and angles in a triangle. Um, so more theorems today about triangles. Our objectives are we want to understand that the large side of a triangle is going to be opposite the largest angle. Understand that there is a range of possible sizes for each side of a triangle. It can't just be any length. They have to be within a certain range. Um, we're going to use properties of isosceles triangles to find missing measurements and properties of equilateral triangles to find missing measurements. So let's first look at inequalities in a triangle. So for any triangle, if two sides are not congruent, meaning that they're not the same size, then the larger angle is going to be across or opposite the lar the longer side. Um, and on the flip side of that, if two angles aren't the same size, then they the longer side is going to be across from the larger angle. So you'll also hear this being called the hinge theorem um, or the door theorem, because you can kind of think of this as a door opening. The farther I open my door, the longer this distance is going to be. If I open my door all the way to here, I'd have a much longer side. So the bigger the angle, the longer the side. Um, so if we look at this triangle here, this side is the longest side. So that would mean this is the biggest angle in the triangle. Um, so that's again can be called the hinge theorem, you'll see it. Um, some people call it the door theorem. Um, but yeah. So let's look at a few problems here. You'll be asked to order the sides or angles of a triangle um, just based on measurements. So on these first three they want you to order the angles and notice they give you the side lengths. So we want to go from smallest to biggest. So if my side lengths are four, six, and seven, I'm first gonna find the smallest side, which is four. That angle across from it is going to be the smallest angle. Again, think of it as a door opening. Um, my door is not open as far, so this angle is going to be the smallest. So angle F would be the smallest. And then, oh, we're going largest to smallest. I did it backwards. <laughs> Careful, that's really easy to do, do it backwards. Largest to smallest. So if this is the largest side, side seven, that would be the angle opposite of it or across from it, angle E would be the biggest one. So angle E would be the biggest. Then if side six is the middle length side, the angle across from that is D, that would be the middle length. And then that leaves F as the smallest side. So smallest to biggest. Um, on this one, our side lengths are three, six, and eight. So the largest side is this side eight, which is across from angle Q. And then the middle length side is six, across from that is angle P. And then the shortest side is angle R. One more of these, this time our lengths are five, seven, and 10. So the biggest side is 10 right here, which is across from angle C. So angle C is the biggest angle. Then seven would be the middle side and across from that is angle A. So that's the middle angle. And then five is the smallest side and across from that is angle B. So the order from biggest to smallest is C, A, B. So now let's do the reverse of that. This time we're given angle measurements and they want you to off of those angles figure out the sides from longest to shortest. Sometimes they might not give you all three angles. Notice on this one we have a 15 degree and 130 degree. They didn't tell us what angle F is. So you might have to calculate that based off the fact that we know the three angles have to add up to be 180 degrees. So if I do 180 and I subtract the 130, that just leaves over 50. And if I do 50 minus 15 degrees, that gives me a total of 35. So this angle would be 35 degrees. So now I can figure out, based off of those angle sides, what side is the biggest to smallest. So 130 is going to be my biggest angle, which means this side across from it is the longest side. So DF would be the longest side. Um, you could also say FD if you wanted to 
switch those letters. And then from there, 35 is the middle size angle or angle F. So across from angle F is this side. So again, you could call it DE or ED, but side DE would be the middle. And then since 15 is our smallest angle, across from that would be side EF or FE, just depending on which way you want to write the letters. So that would be our three sides. Okay, let's try this one. This time we have a 35 degree angle and a 70 degree angle. I don't know, it might be kind of hard for you guys to read that on the video. Um, but they didn't give us angle R again. So I want to subtract both of these from 180 to see how much is left over. So if I do 180 minus 70 is 110, and 110 subtract 35 is 75. So this angle is 75, which is actually the biggest out of all three numbers. So angle R is the biggest angle, which means the side across from it, side PQ, is going to be the longest side. And then 70 is the second longest or second biggest angle. So across from that is side PR or RP. And then that leaves this as the shortest angle, angle P, and across from that is RQ. So smallest to biggest again. I mean, sorry, biggest to smallest. I'm struggling today. So then on this last one, we have 100 degrees and we have 35 degrees, but again, they left one of them blank. So if I subtract them, 180 subtract 100 is 80, and 80 subtract 35 is 45. So this angle is 45 up here, 35, 100. So since 100 is our biggest angle, across from that is going to be our longest side. So the side SV or VS would work. And then the second biggest angle is the 45 degree angle. So across from angle S is this side. So either TV or VT. And then the shortest or smallest angle is 35 degrees. So across from that will be this shortest side, which is ST or TS. And there you go. So you'll have some of those questions on your homework where you are just ordering those from smallest to biggest. Um, but I want to look at another type of problem you will run in, run across, and that is having to do with inequalities. So as I was saying at the very beginning of this video, um, for any triangle, you can't just have any mix of side lengths. Um, there's a certain range that is going to work in order for the actual sides to meet up to make a triangle. Um, if I have one side too long, then maybe this shorter side wouldn't be able to reach it and vice versa. So you actually can't just have any three lengths. You have a certain range that will work to make the sides of a triangle. So that is going to be called the triangle inequality theorem. So for any triangle, the sum, remember sum means to add, so the addition of the lengths of any two sides must be greater than the length of the third side. So if I have three sides of a triangle, I need to be able to add any two of those, and that has to be bigger than the third side left over. So this is saying like side AB plus side BC, if I add those two numbers together, has to be longer than this side. Or if I add these two sides together, the two numbers added have to be bigger than this length and so on. So if you have a triangle and they give you the lengths, on this one we have lengths two, three, and seven, we need to make sure if I add any two of those numbers, it's going to be bigger than the third side. So if I take two and three, two plus three has to be greater than the leftover side, which is seven. So if I look at this, well, two plus three is five. Is five greater than seven? No, that's not true. So this is going to mean we don't have a triangle. Um, we wouldn't actually be able to make those side lengths meet up to form the three sides of a triangle. This side seven is too long to work. So um, that's kind of the idea behind the triangle inequality theorem. So let's practice a few more. So on this one, it says, can a triangle have side lengths seven, 12, and 13? Again, we wanna be able to add any two and see if it's bigger than the third. So I need to have seven plus 12 
needs to be bigger than 13, which obviously it is. 7 plus 12 is 19, and 19 is bigger than 13, so that works. Um, we could also try and adding like 7 and 13 has to be bigger than 12. Well, 7 and 13 is going to be 20, and 20 is bigger than 12. And then I also need to add 12 and 13 have to be bigger than 7, which obviously that one is going to since they already individually are both bigger than 7 anyways. So we'd have 25 is greater than 7. So I usually just check the two smaller numbers. We know if they're already bigger than the third one to start with. Like 13 is already bigger than 12, so we're not going to have an issue here. 12 and 13 are already bigger than 7. So these ones we already know are going to work out you can really just check the two smaller numbers and make sure that the two smaller sides, when you add them together, are bigger than the remaining side. And usually just checking that one is going to be enough. So for example, if I look at this one, six, eight, and nine, six and eight are the two smaller sides. So I wanna check and make sure that if I add those two smaller sides, that they're bigger than the third side. So is six plus eight greater than nine, which it is. So. 6 plus 8 gives us 14, so we're good. So yes, we would have a triangle. Okay, um, so those are if they give you all three sides, but sometimes they will only give you two sides and say, well, what could be the length of the third side? What would be the range there? So on this one, it says two sides of a triangle are 5 and 3. What could the length of the third side be? So this is going to be a range of values. I know that if I add these th two numbers together, the third side has to be bigger than it, right? Five plus three has to be greater than whatever that third side is. Well, I know five plus three is eight. So let's just put an X here. We're just trying to figure out what that third side is. So I know X has to be bigger than eight, or sorry, smaller than eight, less than eight. Um, and then we also have the other scenarios that remember if I add all the sides together, I know that x plus 3 has to be bigger than 5, or that x plus 5 has to be bigger than 3. Um, this one's already going to work no matter what x is, since 5 is already bigger than 3. But let's look at this one. What number does x have to be in order to be bigger than 5? So we can actually just solve for x by subtracting the 3 over. You can probably just do it in your head, though. 5 minus 3 is 2. So if I look at these two values, I'm saying x has to be bigger than 2, but smaller than 8. So if I write that as one inequality, we're saying that the range for this third side has to be between 2 and 8. So 2 has to be, we have to be bigger than 2, but smaller than 8. And that would be your answer. So kind of the um, process that you want to do is you want to add the two numbers together, and we know it has to be bigger than that but then you wanna subtract the smaller number. So it's like you're taking the smaller number and you're adding it to the other number to get this one, and you're taking the smaller number and you're subtracting it from the other number to get this guy. So like if I look at this one, 12 and 15, and I wanna see what that third side could be, I know that I need to add these two together, 12 plus 15, and that has to be bigger than my missing side x. Well, 12 plus 15 is going to be 27. So that's going to be kind of the top end of my range. I can't go past 27. But then to get the shorter end, the smaller side of our range, I'm going to take the smaller number and subtract it. Or you can think of it as an equation. I know that 12 plus x has to be bigger than 15. And if I minus that 12 over that leaves me with x has to be bigger than 3. So my range is going to be between these two numbers. So I know x has to be bigger than 3, but smaller than 27. And as long as it's between those two numbers, my triangle will work and I'll be good. Okay, so you'll see some of those on your homework as well. Um, again, that's your triangle inequality theorem, which is why we have inequalities. So. Um, another type of problem that you will run into, let me slide this up, um, on these ones they want you to find a, the range of possible values for each variable. So notice we have two triangles here on problem number three. 
these little notches on these two sides are saying this side is the same length as this side. And these double notches are saying this bottom side is the same length as this side. But we know the angle on this one and they gave us an equation for the angle on this guy. So notice that the third side, they're saying this one is 12, but this one is only 11. So this is going back to that hinge theorem. They're saying this door, think of it as a door, is opening to 12 wide, but this door is only opening to 11. So this angle is not as big as this angle since it's not opened as far. This distance is smaller than this triangle. So we can write an inequality. We're saying this angle has to be smaller than 58 degrees. So if I take that equation, 3x minus 2, it's less than or smaller than this angle, 58 degrees. And then if I start solving for x, that's going to give me the range of possible values. So if I add 2 over, I get 3x is less than 60, and then divide by 3, well, 60 divided by 3 is 20. So what this is saying is as long as x is smaller than 20, um, it will work for these two triangles, and that would be your answer. Okay. So um, let's look at another one. On this one, they have the two triangles put together, but we have this triangle kind of on the bottom left and then this triangle on the top right and they're sharing this side so um if they're sharing this side you can kind of think of that notch being there this angle and this angle is what we're relating it to we want to check these sides to see which one's smaller or bigger so i see from this angle across is only eight whereas this angle opens up to 14. So this angle, if I think of it as a door again, is opening a lot more than this angle. This one's only opening up to eight. So this angle is smaller than the 86 degrees. So that's how I'm going to know how to set up my equation. I'm gonna take that two X minus four, and it has to be smaller or less than that 86 degree angle. And then we just start solving. So I'm going to start solving for X by adding four over those cancel and I get 2x is less than 86 plus 4 which is 90 and then divide by 2 and I get x is less than 45. So what this is saying is as long as um, x is smaller than 45 I can plug any number in there and it's going to work for that. Okay moving on Here's more about our hinge theorem again. Um, so considering that you have this triangle, we have two triangles here. We have triangle ABC and XYZ. If two of the sides are the same, notice again the notches. They're saying this side with one line through it is the congruent or the same size as this line. And then if this has two on each of these, that means these two sides are congruent. Then they're saying if angle B and angle y, if I open them, that's going to tell me the lengths and the angles will have that relationship. Again, think of it as a door hinging open. Um, you can see kind of like on those problems you were doing, which side is bigger. So it's important though, that when you have a problem like this, um, that the angle has to be between the two sides that are the same size. So I have to have this relationship where these two sides match the same length and these two sides match the same length. And we're looking at this angle in between them. So you can think of that as being a side angle side triangle. We need that side angle side relationship in order for that hinge theorem to work. Um, if we're looking at like angle A or C and using these sides, it doesn't apply. So it needs to be the angle that's between the two sides that it's sharing. So again, that's just more of your hinge theorem um, that you'll see. But let's look at isosceles triangles and equilateral triangles, which you guys probably know, or at least hopefully recognize those words. Uh, but an isosceles triangle is going to be a triangle with two congruent sides. Remember congruent, there's our little symbol for it, an equal sign with a little squiggle on top. Um, that means that they're the exact same size. So in the case of a triangle, we're saying the two sides are the same length. 
And you'll see that by putting these little notches in the side. They're saying that those two sides are the same measure. Um, and we're going to show that by putting these lines in it. Um, you'll also see them call these as the legs of the triangle. We're saying these two legs are the same size. Um, but then if you have these two legs the same size, we say that these base angles, we call them the base angles since they're kind of at the bottom of the triangle. If these sides are the same size, then these angles have to be the same. And again, that kind of goes back to the hinge theorem. If this side is opening up this big, and this side is opening up the same amount, then the doors have to be open to the same angle, right? In order to get the same distance on the sides. So um, if their legs are the same, then those base angles are also the same. So you'll get problems where they give you equations that you need to solve. Um, that's probably really small for you to see. This angle is 4x, let me write it a little bit bigger. And this angle is 6x minus 36. So if I'm trying to solve for x on this one, then first I see, oh, well, they've told us that we have these two congruent sides. That means I have an isosceles triangle. If I have an isosceles triangle, then this angle has to be the same size as this angle. So I can set those equal to each other. So I'm going to say if I take the first angle, 4x, and set it equal to the other angle, 6x minus 36, and then I'm just solving for x. So let's get our x's on one side. I'm going to minus the 6x over. 4x subtract 6x is a negative 2x equals a negative 36. But then if I divide by negative 2, I get x is equal to, and then two negatives are going to make a positive 36 divided by 2 is... 18. So we just found that x is 18. But be careful, they didn't say solve for x. They said find the measure of each angle. So I know what x is, but now I need to plug it back in. So if I plug it into 4x, I'm going to get 4 times 18 to figure out how big that is. And 4 times 18 is equal to 72. So if this angle is 72 degrees, well, I also know automatically that this angle is 72 degrees as well, because they're the same. They did say to find the measure of all of the angles though, so they want to know this top angle as well. So I don't have an equation to plug it into, but I do know that the three angles have to add up to be 180, right? So if I subtract from 180, I can minus the 72 for this angle, minus the 72 for my other angle, and see what's left over. So if I subtract those really quick, 180 minus 72 minus 72 is going to give us a leftover of 36 degrees. So we would be done. So I would say angle A, that's the top one, is 36 degrees. Angle B is 72. But then angle C is also 72 since we do have that isosceles triangle and then I would be done. So just always check your directions and make sure you're following through. Um, sometimes they'll just say to solve for X and you would be able to stop right here. But if they actually want to know the measure of each angle, you need to take it one more step and plug it in to get those answers. So. Okay, for an equilateral triangle, um, an equilateral triangle is going to be congruent on all of the sides and all of the angles. Again, you can kind of think as equilateral as an equal triangle. So you'll see these little notches in all three sides saying all three of those are the same and the little arcs in the three corners to show that those three angles are the same. So equilateral triangles are nice to work with because everything is the same size. So if I know all three angles are the same size, how big is each angle in an equilateral triangle? Well, I know they still need to add to 180, right? But they're also all the same size. So if I just split 180 degrees evenly between three angles, if I just divide that by three, that gives me 60 degrees. So each angle is going to be 60 degrees in that triangle, which you can kind of just memorize. So when you run across equilateral triangle problems, we can use those facts about all the sides being the same and all the angles being the same to help us to solve. And I don't know why my printer just randomly prints little circles here. <laughs> so I don't know if that did that for you guys. Um, let me pull up. Okay. So um, when we 
want to solve these, um, this circle shouldn't be here, you can just ignore it. They're saying find the measure of angle two, given that angle two, this guy right here, is equal to six X minus 12. So I know that we have 180 degrees total or 60 degrees per each angle. So I know this has to be 60 degrees. So if this angle is equal to 60 degrees, what is X? So I'm mean, gonna have six X minus 12 and set it equal to 60. And then let's start solving for X. So I'm going to add the 12 over, those cancel, and I get 6X is equal to 60 plus 12, which is 72. And then we'll divide by 6. And 72, if I divide that by 6, is equal to 12. So we just said X is equal to 12. All right. Um, let's look at this guy. So we have this triangle right here. Let me write this bigger in case you can't read it. This angle has the equation 4x plus 24, and this equation is 11y minus 23. And again, just ignore these little circles. I don't know why they're there. Um, they want us to find the values of x and y. So we have kind of two parts. I have this equation that has x in it and this equation that has y. Let's do the x one first. I see that I have these three lines here, which means I have an equilateral triangle. So I know all three of these angles have to be 60 degrees since they're all equal to each other. So I can take this equation and set it equal to 60 and solve. So first to solve for X, I would minus the 24 over so that those cancel and I get 4X equals 60 minus 24, which is 36. And then divide by four to get X alone. So those cancel and I get 36 divided by four, which is nine. So now we have X, but then we also need to solve for this guy. So this is our exterior angle. It's the angle created on the exterior or the outside of the triangle. But what we can do is I don't know how many degrees this are outright. They didn't just tell me, but I do know the interior angle is 60. So if I have this interior angle plus this exterior one, they make a straight line. And how many degrees total make a straight line? Well, that's equal to 180 degrees. So if I subtract this interior angle from 180, that will tell me what's left over for the exterior angle. Well, 180 minus 160 is 120 degrees. So this angle on the outside has to be 120 degrees. So if I set that equal to this formula, I can solve for y. So I'm gonna do 120 is equal to 11y minus 23, and then solve for y. So first, let's get rid of this by adding 23 over to the other side. So those cancel and I get 120 plus 23 is 143, and then that is equal to 11y. And then if we divide by 11 on each side, 143 divided by 11 is equal to 13. And now you have your two answers. So X was nine and 13 is Y. So that's kind of how you will solve equilateral triangles is just knowing that each of the angles have to be 60 degrees. So you can set that equation equal to 60. Or if you have an exterior angle, if this guy is 60, then the outside has to be 120, since the two of them, 60 plus 120, have to add to be 180 in order to make that straight line. So kind of just putting all those pieces together will help you set up your problems and solve. So that is it for this whole unit, actually. This is the last unit or section in our unit. So we will be getting ready for our test next time. Um, we're gonna have a test review and then our test. Please feel free to reach out to me um, to get help before you take the test if you need it and try and stay on top of your work. Procrastination is not your friend. <laughs> um, I know from experience, so I've been there. So try and get things done on time and feel free to reach out to me uh, by email if you need any help. Hope you guys are doing well and I will talk to you later.